Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse. It gives me great pleasure today to introduce Stefania Massoni, somebody that contacted me who had been listening to It's Rainmaking Time. And in a discussion with her, I realized that she had been training with two Kung Fu masters in New York Chinatown and had an unusual experience and expertise that very few women could talk about. Typically, Kung Fu is transmitted at the highest levels to men. And as a result of her being one of the first women I've ever heard of or met in Kung Fu, particularly in the United States of America, and the way she talked about her training was so fascinating, I invited her to the show. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Stefania Massoni to It's Rainmaking Time. Good morning. Hi, Kim. How are you? (laughs) Good. Or I should say good afternoon, New York time. (laughs) It's all good. First of all, you've been involved as a fine arts painter You are an interior designer with a background in feng shui, actually the ancient form of feng shui that never made its way to the U.S. called Kanyu, and you're a mother of three. What were you doing in a kung fu class for 20 years? I've been asked that question so many times. I always had a passion for Asian culture, particularly Chinese, and I started that in high school doing martial arts for gym class. And as the years went on, I just never went back to it for one reason or the other. At one point, I was 28, I started late, or I restarted late for an athlete's timeline, and I just started the Kung Fu and never looked back. There was an inner drive that I never was able to explain. What were you doing in New York's Chinatown for 20 years? That's a long time. (laughs) It was a long time. I started out on one of the schools that was in New Jersey and sort of outgrew that in the sense that my appetite was rather insatiable in terms of knowledge. And so my teacher at that time sent me to his teacher who was in New York, Chinatown. And from there, I knew that I wanted to be with the the top people who really knew their stuff and who taught in a traditional format. And what does that mean? Well, traditional format in a lot of not only ancient Chinese culture, or also many other ancient cultures, is that the true teacher won't accept any old pupil. And that means that you have to grovel. <laughs> you have to kind of beg and then be insistent. And sometimes the process is notorious for taking several years and worst case scenario, many, many years. And that was how I had to start it as well. I found a teacher who was a specialist in weaponry, which was the part that I didn't have. I had the forms and the other stuff, and he wouldn't teach me. It took about three years to get him convinced. After groveling with these big bad kung fu masters, and they finally decided they would teach a Lao Fan, which is a white woman. One of them confessed to me that women were taught kung fu in ancient times, although it's a patriarchal art form. It was passed down father to son and uncle to nephew. But the exceptions would be if there was no son, a daughter would be taught so that the art forms were never lost. And that was a big consideration aside from the self-defense. But then I found out that there was another exception which was not really spoken about, and that was that China is an enormous country, and the kingdoms, between kingdoms, there was an enormous amount of geography, and travel was very slow. It would take sometimes weeks, months to complete a journey, and the women would be left alone with their servants while the men were out traveling or on business, whatever they were doing. So ultimately, the lady of the palace was taught Kung Fu, and she in turn would teach her servants so that when the men were away, they would be able to defend themselves. And one of the things that they did was they would sew whips into their garments so that they could be pulled out at moment's notice, and many women became experts in what they called the double whip. And also the double daggers, which are these short daggers, were easily concealed in the folds of the fabric of their gowns. Same with flying darts, which are small metal darts attached to long chains or string. This I found out later. One of my masters did confess that, in fact, there were a handful of women who became very proficient in this. Very interesting. Very interesting. You know, it always comes to the surface eventually. (laughs) (laughs) 
eventually. And this came to the surface, oddly enough, not because in the old Chinese form of teaching, you don't ask questions. You just are told things and you do it. But there's no question asking, question answer sessions. This came out just kind of as a side comment one day. One, the teacher, one of the exercises for balance and agility that we were taught is a cup on a saucer. And what you do is you stand with your horse stance, they call it, with your feet spread about two feet apart and your pelvis low. Your thighs are parallel to the ground. And you hold a saucer and a teacup in one hand. And what you're asked to do is to rotate it above your head, around your back, back through your arm, and then up over your head so that you're doing kind of like a figure eight above your head and around your back. And this you have to do with both hands so that you work both sides of the body. And it's really strenuous. I mean, you start really sweating. And I said, what in the world? And one teacher said, well, you know, this was used for this and that. This was an exercise for the women, improving their agility. Define what Kung Fu is and how it is distinct from other martial arts. Chinese is an animistic society. In other words, they define life through nature, animals, plant life. It's a self-defense that is based on the movements of animals, tigers and cranes, and through observing the animals, different established movements were put together, and it was used ultimately in combat. Are you dangerous? Yes. (laughs) Of course I'm dangerous. (laughs) (laughs) I better be nice. (laughs) I better ask the right questions, and I better talk really good. (laughs) (laughs) Well, some people are some of the most gentle people you'll ever meet, the true ones. You know, it's a gentle heart. Then why train with ancient Chinese weaponry? What's the point of that? I kind of stumbled into it. It was a part of the knowledge that I didn't have, and I wanted to complete the full spectrum. But what happened was they started teaching me double daggers, for example, which are two short daggers about eight inches in the blade and then the handle. They started teaching me that because it was a feminine weapon. They would teach the women the short weapons. And I found that it came very naturally. I remembered everything versus there were other parts of Kung Fu, which I had to go over and over in repetition. It was like a dance. I had to just keep going over the steps. But the moment I had a weapon in my hand, it was very natural. What does this mean that it was natural? (laughs) I didn't struggle to learn it. I do know what natural meant. I more meant, I wonder why it was natural to you. I don't know. I've searched my soul for this answer and kind of an oddity. So my only answer has been that I must have been some kind of warrior in a past life or in several lives. This is my deduction. That's what I thought. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, you know, you go into karmic philosophy here. Talk about your training, how they trained you. I thought that was fascinating. Talk about your training to the audience. The training was absolutely grueling. It was my choice, however, let's be clear. Nobody was forcing me to do anything. However, once I was finally accepted as a student and only one of two female students at this level, it was absolutely grueling. And I was there, I was doing it seven days a week. You have to practice probably, I would say, twice a day, morning and evening, between (laughs) breastfeeding. Wow. And when we had class, we would have the normal class, and then those of us who were doing the weaponry would stay uh, a couple of hours later into the evening. And the teacher basically would show us the new moves, one, two, three, and he'd observe our homework, what we did, and if we got it, and then he would leave, you know. He would get himself a cup of tea and go on the phone, and we would basically be left in a room by ourselves for a couple of hours. How would you know what to do if you're left in a room by yourself for hours at a time? You have to figure it out. <laughs> Absolutely figure it out. <laughs> How many people were in a training class with you? Yeah, on the higher levels, it would be maybe four or five, seven, eight at the most. But there's attrition, too, because it's a lot of 